to for the platform to join in. Let us stand. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it's a spirit of the Lord. They are blind expressions on each face and I know the feel the presence of the Lord sweet Holy Spirit sweet Sabbath family. We will now have our opening song, which is hymn number 467. My apologies. We're going to do 626. In a little while, we're going home. That's a closing soon. That was a closing song. We'll, we'll, we'll fix it. We'll switch okay. it up. Two, three. Let us sing a song that will cheer us by the way. In a little while we're going home. For the night will end in the everlasting day. In a little while we're going home. In a little while, in a little while. Shall cause the billows foam. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past. In a little while we're going home. We will do the work that our hands may find to do. In a little while we're going home. And the grace of God will our daily strength renew. In a little while we're going home. In a little while, in a little while, shall cross the billows for billow foe. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past. In a little while we're going home. We will smooth the path for some weary worn our feet. In a little while we're going home. 
And may loving hearts spread around in friends so sweet In a little while we're going home In a little while, in a little while We shall cross the billows foam We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past In a little while we're going home There's a rest beyond There's relief from every care In a little while we're going home And no tears shall fall in that city bright and fair in a little while we're going home In a little while In a little while We shall cross the billows foam We shall meet at last When the stormy winds are past In a little while we're Amen. In a little while, we will be going home. At this time, we're going to have a uh, testimony. Anybody have a praise report for the week? I, I know you do. I know you do. I know you do. You may be seated, guys. Anybody would like to be first? Okay. We got Josh, and then we got Sage. All right. So this week at work, um, I went on a, a job that I'm typically not on, and this one guy that I was working with, he kept on saying um, over and over and over, Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, but it was very obvious that he didn't know what he was talking about. So that gave me a chance to talk to him about this, and I've been praying for the guy. Um, just that uh, he would be even more open unto understanding who God is and the truth and talking about this Day of Atonement and talking about Jesus and such. So I thought it was uh, quite interesting how, um, you know, like, I, I hunger to, to talk to people about this. Mm -hmm. But I, at the same time, too, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. So uh, I just, I definitely want to testify that God definitely knows my heart that he wants me to be able to uh, talk to others about this. And this was just a great opportunity. I don't know where it's going to go after that. Maybe it was just a, it was just a time to plant a seed. Um, but as the Lord leads, Amen. You know, I will go. Amen. Amen. Thank you for sharing, Josh. Anybody else? Have, oh, Sage, I'm sorry. What's your testimony, baby? <laughs> so, Praise God. Amen. Thank you for 
sharing. Praise God for that. Now, I'm, I'm sure some of, the, some of the parents are crying when they come to pick up the kids too. You know? <laughs> yes, my sister. Now, I have done this in the past. I have worked in a few colleges and down in the city. So I was kind of excited, and especially the money was very good. But the funny thing is that when I pray, every time I finish praying, I feel funny about it. Like, as if the Lord did not want that. Yeah. So I started questioning it. So I sent an email to the administrator to find out um, what's the take on the COVID vaccine and the boosters and the wearing the mask and everything. Because I wanted this all clear, you know. I figured that's the way that the Lord is trying to show me that something is coming. Mm -hmm. So they ignored my emails, did not respond to my emails. I made a few calls. I personally drove over to the, to the, to the school to talk to someone. And the lady I met, she said, well, I, you know, no one is here to answer this question. Um, if that's how you feel, maybe you should just wait until you hear someone before you continue. I said, okay, that sounds good. And uh, uh, a week before I'm supposed to begin class, the, they called me and uh, I said, well, I, you know, I sent all these emails and trying to contact you guys to find out what is your take on that, whatever, whatever. And, um, and I said, listen, I'm not wearing masks. I'm not taking vaccine, I'm not taking boosters, I don't believe in those things, I'm not going to do it. So um, he was kind of shocked to hear that. I said, I have been trying to reach you guys. Today. And do you know, after I said all of this, like a peace came on you. Amen. Oh my God, I said, <laughs> Father, that's all, you, that's all you've been telling me. That's all you've been telling me. And do you know, a week later, the governor of New York said that Last Friday was the, the first day to begin taking the new vaccine for the new variant that comes. I said, Lord, I want to thank you. God is so good. You know, you, you pray, you ask, you believe, and he just shows you and just directs. And I just want to thank God for that direction. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Sister White. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Um, my testimony is I'm thankful for two things. Uh, one is I'm so grateful for the Sabbath. Uh, like, you know, some people will say, you know, when God created Sabbath, he created it for me. But in this day and age, the hustle and bustle that we go through and the ability to say, we can rest. Literally, and you could ask my kids, literally when, when, when sunset hits, me and my wife says, ah. <laughs> right? You can, you, can relate. you can relate. So I'm just so thankful for God's Sabbath, the ability to stop, and not only stop, but to truly reflect upon him. We fit him in through the week. Even if you're given a, a solid hour a day, we're still fitting him. But to be able to have a 24-hour to spend with him and to do his will within that time frame is a blessing. Second thing I want to be thankful for is I want to be thankful for being here at church. Uh, when, COVID, when COVID hit, you know, a virtual church changed the whole dynamics, right? Um, but there's nothing like being in here physically to, to see you guys, to have the embrace, to hear a sermon, you know, the sermon is good. It's good on, on, on the online. I thank you, online family. But it's like I, I gave the analogy to somebody before uh, who couldn't understand why to go back. And I'll keep mine short. Three things is when you're hearing the word, one, when you're hearing the word, it's like going to a concert. Watching a concert, not that I'm condoning it, but watching the concert on your screen is different than being in person. 
The feeling, totally different. Hearing the word, it reaches you. God used whatever conduit. But being physically present to hear it is a totally different dynamic. To hear the testimonies, right, about Josh having the opportunity to have his prayer answered like Cornelius's was, or the peace that my sister got when she was able to say what God is impressed her to say and saw his provision. To hear it first person is a blessing. The Sister White uh, giving magnitude to the lesson, which I really enjoyed this week too. To me, out of all the weeks, 12 was the best. It's such a blessing. And then the third thing is literally the fellowship. The conversations that we have, the breaking bread that we have, not because I'm big, I like food. I do like food, but it's not because I'm big, right? But the questions and the dialogues. We went to Sister Nicole house for a barbecue and the conversations that Ray and Josh, um, Josh was able to have that we took part in. When we go downstairs and we ask, hey, how did you overcome this? Or, hey, what is this like for you? And to be able to get that advice and that soundboard and that dialogue and that reflection and sometimes the call to actions. Sometimes it's not just the pastor that gives and we're going to lift them up in prayer, but it's also uh, having a conversation and somebody's like, you know what? I feel like we should be doing this. And it's like, you know what? You're right. We should. Or it's, hey, this is what I'm struggling with. And then to have somebody physically, personally give it to you. A lot of times we rely on Facebook algorithm to help us through our issues when we have brothers and sisters here. My, my father-in-law is having issues with his eyes. You gave a presentation about castor oil. You best believe so son hit. Boom. Listen, have you tried castor oil for your eyes? It, it actually, we had a, a beautiful health nugget. I'm telling you, it might work. You understand? So that kind of fellowship and that kind of dynamic and that kind of dialogue and that kind of embodiment of the body, you cannot get virtually. We try as much as we can, and for those who are in particular situations, we understand. We see where you're coming from. Thank you for joining us. But that admonishment for me to be here is one of the biggest blessings. Right? Um, with that being said, it's now time for a prayer request. Does anybody here would like to share a prayer request? For those who are online, you can also have the ability to type it in the chat. Um, and we will keep it not only in prayer here, but we'll keep it in prayer throughout the week. Anybody have a prayer request? Sister White. For the sick and checking and for the absent members. Yes, ma'am. Pray for them. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Valid. That's valid. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? Sister Donna?
Yes, ma'am. I will do. If there aren't any others, we will have prayer. I'm not gonna get sick at all. Um, you wanna do something? Now, dear Lord, as we pray, take our hearts and minds far away. Abound. May our lives be transformed by your love. May our souls be refreshed from above. At this moment, let people everywhere join us now as we come to you. Dear Heavenly Father, first and foremost, um, come before you again in body and unison, praying that you will forgive us for any sins, any deeds, any actions that were not thought of at the moment to confess. Dear Lord, I pray that during this segment that you will, through the help of your spirit, commit to memory whatever that is that we may offer it on to you. Dear Lord, you have heard the request of your children. Dear Lord, we pray that you would be with them. Dear Lord, touch those who are missing. Dear Lord, we know what it's like. We know that Satan is like a raw lion seeking who he may devour, and he will use whatever means to keep us distracted, to keep us dismayed, to keep us bombarded in work. Dear Lord, you know that those who came through this, through these doors have heard the seed. Dear Lord, may you allow it to be germinated and grow. For those who are at different locations, giving you praise, honor, and glory, pray that you be with them. For those who are online, at home, who have not been able to make it today for whatever reason, we pray a prayer of thanksgiving and that they may be blessed by the service that's here. Dear Lord, we pray that you'll be with those who are sick, sick and are not able to come in. Dear Lord, we pray that you be with their ailments. Dear Lord, we pray that you grant healing upon their body. Dear Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit mixed with the immune system will be able to provide restoration. Dear Lord, not just physically, dear Lord, but spiritual restoration and restoration of the mind. In our day and our age in America, there are so many individuals that are dealing with mental anguish. There are so many people that are dealing with depression, anxiety. There are so many individuals who are battling with the decision of suicide, dear Lord. And I just pray that you will touch and heal them. You are still the great physician. You are still a miracle worker, dear Lord. We know that you still touch lives, dear Lord. So we in body in unison are asking that you'll touch and heal them. Touch the young lady um, who the teacher, Syracuse teacher who was, who went to Phoenix or went to Arizona to go to training, dear Lord, who got injured. We pray a, a special prayer for her. Dear Lord, we pray that you'll grant her expeditiously um, wholeness, dear Lord, that she'll be able to go back into her work. Dear Lord, we pray that you'll be with Donna's family. Dear Lord, we pray that you'll touch and heal, not, not touch and heal them, but you'll be with them. Uh, also, my sister, whose name I'm forgetting at the moment, dear Lord, and though I may have forgotten the name, you know her intimately. I pray that you'll be with her family as well, that you'll be with all of our families in regards to salvation. Amen. Dear Lord, we pray that you'll be with your man's servant, uh, young Pastor Dixon, who is also in the different side of the vineyard laboring for you, dear Lord. I pray that you put your words in his mouth, dear Lord. I pray that the Spirit will gather individuals to come 
Dear Lord, I pray that you will help the timely message that you have placed upon him will be received and that many would be one for you. Dear Lord, we also lift up our pastor here, Pastor Dixon, as you have placed upon him a word for your people. I pray that we'll be able to receive it, dear Lord. I pray that uh, that there won't be any distractions that will hinder us from soaking in the word and the message that is to be delivered. Uh, dear Lord, we there may have been some unspoken requests, dear Lord, the people that have made their requests online. Dear Lord, I pray that you'll see them too, that you'll grant victory upon you, dear Lord. Dear Lord, every person that, made, that have made a request, I pray that you'll hear it. I know that you'll hear it individually but as a unison dear lord as we're interceding for one another dear lord we know that we receive amiss because we ask amiss dear lord and we ask wavering is why we don't get so in fullness of faith we pray that you grant healing and if i sound too boastful pre-event dear lord forgive me but we thank you for the miracles that you will do and we thank you for the will that you will have because we know that your way is greater than ours, but you still hear the request of your children and grant access due to the unison in prayer. So as the people pray for Preto to give him freedom from the prison, we are praying that you hear our prayers so that our family can be freedom, freed from the bondage that they're dealing with, whether it's financial, spiritual, mental, physical, that you will grant it. Whatever we fail the request, dear Lord, please fail not to grant, and thank you for your patience with us. May we move in unison to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. We will now have offertory by Brother Jim. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Before I begin uh, to speak concerning tithes and offerings, uh, let us pray for assistance from heaven. Dear kind, merciful Father in heaven, I come before you and to acknowledge that surely I can do nothing without you. I ask that you be with me now, Father, and have me submit to your will, placing self behind the cross so that I may present this message before the congregation properly. Thank you, Father, for considering us and being mindful of our needs. I ask and pray all these things in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is written, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? That's found in the uh, book of Luke, chapter 14, verse 28. A young man was anxious about his upcoming wedding. Although he was pleased that his bride-to-be was the one he had prayed for, but he did have some real concerns for their finances as a new couple. The young man realized that he would be the only one earning a salary and previously as a bachelor he could hardly reach the next payday without borrowing some money. However, during the first month, the first quarter and the first year of marriage, happily the one income was sufficient for the couple's expenses. They could even reach the next payday with a bit left over for savings. The result was great peace of mind for both of them. How was that possible? Well, during their wedding preparation, the pastor counseling the couple reminded them about the instruction Jesus gave to sit down and estimate the cost. They both learned about the importance of a family budget. Neither of them was an accountant, but with practice, discipline, and of course, with God's help, 
They soon establish a budget and roadmap for their expenses. We worship God and return to him a portion of our financial resources, not only because he is the provider of the many benefits and blessings in our lives, but he is also a caring, gentle advisor and counselor. Jesus taught that everything comes with a cost and it is wiser to comprehend the cost and plan accordingly. This life management principle applies to all aspects of our Christian walk. Walk, ignoring or neglecting this principle often brings embarrassment, complications, and pain. Today we live in a time where we are constantly enticed to use our financial resources without thinking and planning. Commercials and viral advertising appeal to our five senses. Unfortunately, basing our spending on what we see, hear, touch, smell, and taste, often falling to the temptation of impulse buying as it is known in the merchandise selling industry. The result is an unhealthy spending pattern leading to some dire consequences. The creator, owner, and provider of all resources provides valuable insights to help us avoid the pitfalls of unwise expenditures. This Sabbath, as we worship with our tithe and offerings, being faithful and obedient to God's promises, let us place God and his prudent guidance on the forefront of how we are to use these gifts to his glory. May the deacon come forward. Let us pray. Dear kind, merciful Father in heaven, we come before you in reverence and gratitude and the knowledge that you are the creator of all things. We thank you, Father, for setting aside the seventh day, a Sabbath day in which we can rest from this workaday world, a sanctified day in which we can spend time with you in prayer and contemplation. Please help us reason together as we study your profound written words so that we may learn more about your perfect character. Thank you, Father, for the many blessings and benefits you bestow upon us daily, in turn sharing amongst each other experiences of your goodness as we have heard during today's praise and testimony. We also thank you for being a strong foundation, a rock on which we can anchor ourselves in any storm, content to be dependent on you for all things. As the deacon collects tithes and offerings from the congregation, have us direct these donations for a purpose which is proper in your sight, Father, so that we may glorify your name. Please bless those who have given and also bless those who cannot give at this time we ask and pray all these things in the name of the only Lamb found worthy to be the permanent solution to the problem of sin, your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We will now have our health nugget from our very own sister, MJ. Amen.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, before I start, I'm going to pray, but also um, this presentation was made by my friend Bethlehem Kaler, so all credit goes to her. And also the thing that the thing that I'm reading off of, she also made it. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you have done for us, for bringing us all here today. Please be with us as we go throughout the Sabbath day. Please help us to keep it holy. And please help me as I um, present this. And please help all my words to be of you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So the topic of this help nugget is called fear. The reason why she chose this topic is because the world is getting pretty crazy right now, isn't it? And tons of people have lots of fear that they are struggling with. Understanding fear and what it is exactly, we will be able to help those or even ourselves find peace. Before we get too much into the, pre into the presentation, let's take a quick look at what the definition of for fear is. What triggers it and lastly some symptoms of fear. What actually is fear? An unpe unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or threat. What is the trigger for fear? The universal tr trigger for fear is the threat or of harm, real or imagined. This threat can be for our physical, emotional, or phys physiological well-being. So I'm sure all of you have your personal fears, right? Like spiders or snakes. Personally, she strongly dislikes all bugs, but especially flying ants. Their long legs and papery wings just really freaks her out. I looked up top fears hoping to find flying ants up at the top of the list. But alas, the only fears I found were these. Um, Acrophobia, fear of heights, aerophobia, fear of flying, aquaphobia, fear of water, astrophobia, fear of storms, claustrophobia, fear of closed spaces, dentophobia, fear of going to the dentist, and aquaphobia, fear of crowds, and glossophobia, fear of public speaking. I understand all of these fears, but for me, flying ants definitely gets first place. I was really curious if Americans' fear had risen since 2020 since it was a rough year filled with lots of unusual events, and this is what I found. Anxiety levels today compared to one year ago. More than half of the people in the United States have had their fear rise since 2020. In fact, 2020 is recorded as the most stressful year in history. Here's a graph showing how Americans' anxiety, which is likely a really intense or like persistent fear of worry about a situation, levels have and are increasing in 2020. As you can see here, much anxiety levels are definitely on the rise. 7% of the people they interviewed said they were much more anxious this year than last year, while 38% said they were more anxious this year but not super anxious. 26% said they were the same, 24 said they were less, and only 5% said they were much less anxious. With all the stress of politics, personal finances, finances work, etc., many believe that we are going into a major, a major mental health cri crisis. This is a quote from something I found talking about the crisis. As you see, young people are getting the most affected. The suicide death rates are 10 to 12 year olds have, of 10 to 12, 24 year olds have increased by 56%, while global depression and anxiety has increased by 25%. By now, I'm sure all of you got the picture. This world is a disaster and it's not getting any better. Fear, anxiety, and depression is basically taking over the world. My, while it marked while it might be hard to reach the entire world, we can start with ourselves. Then, after that, we can help our friends. Then our friends can help their friends, and so on. Here are some ways that can help us fight fear. One, accept you have fear. This can sometimes be hard. We may want to look like we have no fears and that we are fearless. But no matter how hard we try, we all have at least one fear. If you learn to accept your fear, then you can identify it and find the cause. 
After you find the cause, you can then determine to solve it. Solving something isn't always easy, though, is it? So if you would like, you can ask someone you trust to help you. Facing your fears, for me, is the hardest step of them all. One day, she decided to pick up a flying ant. Of course, they aren't easy to catch, and when you really don't want to catch one, your motivation isn't very strong. I, event I caught it eventually, but only he held it for a few seconds before it was on the way, which was perfectly fine for me. Holding that flying ant wasn't easy, but I'm not as scared of them as I used to be. Exercise and taking deep breaths help with stress and anxiety. Last but not least, don't try to be perfect. Getting over fear is a process. It won't happen overnight, but don't stress. These are a few examples of ways to fight fear. There are countless others that might work better for you or that might not work quite as well. But whatever the case, we need to remember that we have a helper. Jesus is always there for us and he's promised that he'll never abandon us. Here are some verses that, you can, that can help when you are feeling afraid. Psalms 23 verse four says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Psalms 56, verse 3 to 4 says, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust, I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Psalms 91, verse 4, He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thank you for listening and have a wonderful Sabbath. Amen. Thank you, Sister MJ, for reminding us never to be afraid. Um, we will now have Children's Story by Elder Stephenson. Good morning. All right, I have a story. Well, it's not really a story. It's a talk. All right, shall we bow our heads? Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessings you give us day by day. We thank you for giving us this day. And I ask that you will be with us as we go through this day and on through life, that you would guide and protect us. And strengthen us and encourage us in your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <clears throat> Does anyone know what it means to migrate? Yes. Sometimes, all right. What is your definition? No, not, not, it's not a sleep. Yeah, that's hibernate, yes. Uh, some animals migrate. There's the um, 
antelopes in Africa called the Nu. They migrate, I forget how, what the distance is, but they go north at one time of year and then they go, go back to the south to the grasslands, the different grasslands. <coughs> the what? Butterflies? Yes, butterflies. I didn't think of them. Uh, what butterfly? The monarch butterfly. Yes. And there's a thing about the monarch butterflies that uh, science cannot explain. The monarch butterflies live all over the northern North America in the summertime, but they go to Mexico, a particular valley in Mexico for the winter. And, the, and the, they don't all survive, but those that do will fly north when spring comes, and they'll go as far as Canada. And they'll mate and uh, lay eggs, and the eggs will hatch, the caterpillars will uh, grow, and they'll turn into butterflies, and they'll go to Mexico. They've never been there before but they go to this particular valley. That's something that uh, science can't explain and we can only understand it as, as God's directions. What is the longest migrating thing that you know of? The butterfly and the bird. What bird? All the birds. Okay, butterflies, and uh, there's a bird that migrates the longest. It's called the Arctic tern. It's a small bird that uh, has a nest in Alaska, and it'll fly to uh, Antarctica on its migration. That's its migration route as far as Antarctica, the, the coast of Antarctica. And they'll live there for that summer when we're having winter, and then they'll fly back. So they have a round trip uh, flight of 24, 22 to 24,000 miles. <coughs> and they do that in a couple of days. Yes, it's, it's not a real long time. In fact, uh, birds migrate and they fly uh, with a, a, di a direction finder that man has no idea what it is yet. <clears throat> because they've taken a pigeon, they've studied the, the pigeon's homing device or its homing abilities, and a pigeon will, they've taken a pigeon and put little plastic covers over their eyes so they can't see objects. They can see day and night. And take this pigeon like 500 miles away and it flies back to its roost and it's like on the barn roof near the door where it go, normally goes in. It just can't find the door because it can't see it. And so it, it flew back you know, 500 miles without seeing any objects. So they think, they don't know, but they think that the, the pigeon is sensing the Earth's magnetic field and it's directing it, you know, getting its directions from that. <clears throat> Where are we to get our directions? From God. Yes. And what helps us? The Bible? Yes, the Bible. We get our directions from God through the Bible. And as we do, and if we follow them, then God is able to continue to bless us. All right, would someone like, like to pray? 
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you have done for us. Please keep us safe. Please help us to do what you want us to do. Please help us to love you more. And please help us to get your directions through the Bible. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you once again for your blessings. We ask that you would be with us as we go forth through this day and through life, that you would guide and protect us. Give us understanding of your word and help us to be witnesses for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. scripture reading by young evangelist Carlson Wallace. So the scripture reading is taken. Happy Sabbath, everyone. The scripture reading is taken from Romans 1, verse 15 and 16. Please stand. Romans 1, verse 15 and 16. So as much as in me is I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. You may be seated. Sister Sheila Dixon. Happy Sabbath. Everybody. Hark the herald angels sing. Jesus, the light of the world. Glory to the newborn King. Jesus, the light of the world, I walk in the light, beautiful light, down where the dewdrops of mercy shine bright, shine all around me by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world. Do you want to sing with me? Hail. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Jesus, the light of the world. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Jesus, the light of the world, will walk in the light, beautiful light, down where the dewdrops of mercy shine bright, shine all around me by day and by night. <clears throat> 
the light of the world. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh, through the night, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, through the night, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, through the night, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Amen. God be praised. Amen. Amen. At this time, uh, the deliver of the word today is no stranger to us. Uh, we present to you, man of God, Pastor Dixon. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. I feel very tall for some reason. Maybe I should. Where should I be? I'll just move this back. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm just either I grew or I don't know what happened. Things feel different. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Amen. Amen. The songwriter, I believe, made up his mind and came to a conviction that uh, he's going to let his light shine. That's good, yeah. And um, so this morning, my message is entitled Unashamed. Unashamed. And it's taken from Romans 1, as we heard in the scripture reading. And uh, I just want to kind of set the tone and the context of this scripture. And before we open God's word, let us pray. Father in heaven, we invite your Holy Spirit uh, to be present. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans 1. Chapter 15, chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome 
also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Paul seems to be setting a pattern or precedent for Christians to follow. There was a need to set a precedent, an example of boldness that was rooted in the Christian's love for those in the world. And I believe our Apostle Paul is taking that example or that charge from Jesus himself, although he never saw Jesus. He did have an experience with him. You and I may never have seen Jesus physically, but if you have experienced him, it can say, have the same impact as experiencing him bodily and physically. And so in, book, in the book of Mark, chapter 8, Jesus is explaining to his disciples that he's going to die, the Son of Man is going to suffer many things. He's going to be crucified. He's going to suffer and he's going to be killed. But in three days he'll rise again. And Peter is a little bit uneasy with that. And he, re he took Jesus and rebuked him and, and said, this will not happen. Because it sounded like it was off, you know, the agenda. Jesus has a big following. He's healing the sick. Crowds are following him. They expected him to take over the kingdom right there in Jerusalem. So it didn't fit their paradigm of what Jesus' mission was. And the Bible says Jesus turned to Peter, and then he turned to his disciples, and he did not rebuke Peter, but he rebuked the devil. Get thee behind me, Satan. That's what he said. But thou savest the things that be not be of God, but are the things of men. Sometimes we may be prompted to do things that seem right, that feel right, but have nothing to do with God's agenda. And so it is necessary that we be on target through prayer and through self-surrender that we know God where God is. Because it sounded good. I'm protecting you from being crucified. That's not going to happen to you, Jesus. But let me tell you something. The devil is a liar and the father of lies. And he works through deception through things that seem good so that he can get a little edge in. But Jesus, our Savior, is aware of how the church needs protecting. And so he's given us this message today to help us to survive in these last days because we have an enemy that's far wiser than us and we need help. As the Sabbath School lesson pointed out this week, we need to be able to stand, but not in our own strength, because our strength is nothing. And so then he goes on to declare this word, whosoever comes after and me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life will lose it. So Jesus is telling us what it means to be a disciple or a follower of Christ. And then he makes this statement in verse 28, 38. 
Whosoever there shall, therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words, get it, whosoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The same Jesus that was willing to die for us. The same Jesus that loved us enough to give his life for a sacrifice for the sins of men is calling us not to be ashamed of him or his words. And I believe when Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew and to the Gentile. Paul is suggesting that there needs to be an example of unashamedness in the body of Christ. He's also sort of concerned that the believers were becoming less bold about the mission of Christ. and ashamed of his mission. So this morning we want to explore what is this problem? What is this remedy for the intoxicating influence of the wine of Babylon that makes us more subject to the influence of the evil one who would have us becoming more ashamed about Christ's agenda and less ashamed and more bold about the world's agenda. The book of Romans was written on Paul's third missionary journey. Paul had never been to Rome, but he's writing from Corinth because he sent Phoebe uh, one, a servant from the Lord, to deliver this message 20 years after the, the crucifixion, 20 years after Pentecost, a church had been established in the heart of Rome because of their experience with the risen Christ and the influence of the Holy Spirit. And Paul was so excited about this new church because it had been raised up in the atmosphere of idolatry and pleasure and, and every worldly enterprise at the time was going on, but yet this church came out of nowhere because of the believers were not ashamed of their faith. Paul had heard about them, he had never seen them, but he wants to send a letter to encourage them. And when you know Christ and you have an experience with him, you have a desire to see the church prosper. And so Paul wants to encourage the Christian church. And every now and then the church needs a little encouragement. What do you say? And Jesus makes sure of that, because in Matthew 16, he said, upon this rock, I build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. Testimonies, volume 15, or but that volume one, page 15, the servant of the Lord writes, I testify, my brothers and sisters, that the church of Christ, enfeebled and defective as it may be, is the only object on earth on which he bestows his supreme regard. Can you imagine that? The only object 
on earth. Yes, he loves his people and he loves every he loves the world, but the church is the only object on earth upon which he bestows his supreme regard. That means the church is very precious to him. Doesn't matter if it's a large church, medium-sized church, doesn't matter if it's a small church, it doesn't matter if it's a company. In his eyes, it's a church. Doesn't matter if they're two or three or four, wherever they're two or three gathered, I'm in the midst of them, he says. And he is concerned about his church, and every now and then he wants to strengthen the church. Paul feels this burden. He can't wait to get there. And so, the servant of the Lord goes on to write, he commissions his angels to render divine help to every soul that comes in repentance and contrition. And he comes personally by his Holy Spirit into the midst of his church. So God loves his church. It may have problems, it may not do everything perfectly. It may be experiencing a little bit of strife, but Jesus' eye is on his church. And God was using Paul to write this letter, having never been there. But tradition says the book of Romans may have been, or the church of, of Rome may have been started by Peter and James. Or it could have been lay people. But this city was a city of pleasure, sports, and art, and Paul was so glad that someone had the nerve, the gall, to share their faith in the midst of that city. He's so glad that believers were not ashamed. They were not ashamed of standing out and being different from the culture of that day, not ashamed and not influenced by the lingo and the speech and the ungodly dress because they decided and they had learned the pe that the peace of Christ was better than whatever the world had to give. And let's turn there to Romans. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at that. I'm having a little problem seeing Hold this Bible up a little bit so I can see it. All right. So in verse 8, he said, To all who be in Rome, beloved of God, called of saints, grace and peace be to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ to all of you that your faith is spoken of throughout the world. So they had made an impact. For God is my witness, whom I serve in my spirit, in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you in my prayers, making requests by any means now, at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God and come to you, that I might share some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. That is, that I may be comfort together with you by our mutual bond of uh, both of faith, both you and I. But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes our purpose to come to you but was hindered that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentile. Paul was celebrating or wanted to celebrate in person the spiritual growth of these believers. He wanted to meet them for the first time. He wanted to share. He wanted to testify. He wanted to, to hear their stories. But he said, but I was hindered. You know, sometimes God hinders us from appointments that we set that in themselves are good, but God has a greater purpose for it, right? And so we've got to be patient with the Lord. Sometimes we are expecting God to do this 
or open this door so that we can get to our children. But God may have closed that door so that those children can learn to stand on their own two feet and have their own relationship with Jesus Christ. It would have been good for you to come, but God closed the door. So Paul was hindered from coming so that fruit might result on God's timetable. And then he said, I'm a debtor. I want to get there because I'm a debtor to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome. Paul made no distinction between culture and, and race and whether you're a bar barbarian or whether you're a Gentile, whether you're a Roman. He did not see class, the gospel. He knew that God was no respecter of persons. And this gospel has to go to every person. And we should have the church that way, way today. God doesn't look at class and whether a person is black or, or white or Chinese. All are precious in God's sight. And Paul was just ready to minister and to share his faith. And then he goes down to it. This is what motivates me. Verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Paul was glad to see the gospel proclaimed to Jews and Gentiles because he knew the power of gospel could change hearts. He understood the power of love. But he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. But yet at the same time, he wanted to give the church a little bit of direction. He sensed that there were some becoming more ashamed of things they needed to be ashamed of and less ashamed of witnessing for Christ. You know, this world is moving in a direction where the things that we used to be ashamed of, no one is ashamed of it anymore. You know, it's become natural and open. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm unabashed in my witness. And he, he, he has the same theme throughout uh, his, his writings, not just in Rome, but, but in other places. He is not ashamed, and he's encouraging believers to stand up, let your light shine. 2 Timothy 1.8, he says, Be not ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, our God. And, and uh, 2 uh, uh, Timothy 1.12 be not ashamed of me, his servant, for which I cause I suffer. Paul was in prison, but there were some believers that weren't ashamed to associate with Paul. 2 Timothy uh, 1.16, Lord, have mercy on Onesiphorus, for he is not ashamed of my chains. Titus 2.8 says, be, not, uh, be ashamed of unconscious speech or un un unsound speech because you give others to give you a reason to be ashamed. So there are some things that uh, we need to be ashamed of and there are things that we shouldn't be ashamed of. But I'm afraid the church today, my brothers and sisters, the church is moving away from being ashamed of the things that we need to be ashamed of and less ashamed to present themselves as disciples of Christ. And this worldly influence is influencing God's people. Teachers are being influenced. Upholders of the gospel truth are becoming ashamed of the truth of Christ. 
That's why Paul is warning in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved, a workman need it not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That word unashamed means unabashed, unblushing, not embarrassed, not having any shame. We need to have that in relation to our witness for, for Christ. To say what God says about this world. Unashamed to say what God says about prophecy, the things that are about to happen on this world. Unashamed to call Satan on the red carpet and not be deceived by his deceptions. Unashamed to witness for Christ. And that's what seems to be happening. There is, the devil is deceiving us. Not outright, just little by little. And the first time that word is used in Genesis, turn with me there to Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. This is the first time we read about that word, ashamed. Verse 225 says, and, they, and it says, after Adam and Eve were, were created, he says, and they were both naked, and the man and his wife were not ashamed. Well, that doesn't seem to make sense. Well, we know through inspiration that Adam and Eve didn't need clothes because they had a holy light around them that covered them. In other words, they had a covering, right? And they were not ashamed. But when they sinned, at least they felt ashamed. Because the Bible says in verse 7, and the, bo and, the, and the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron. And they hid in the garden from the voice of the Lord, And of course, we know the rest of the story. They were ashamed because they had departed from, from God's ways. And this world, brothers and sisters, today is trying to legitimize what you should be ashamed of. Because the enemy has deceived us. And today, we're finding that we have no shame. Society as a whole, no shame among women and men, even children. Children are not ashamed to be disobedient to their parents. Both young and old women are wearing clothes that seem to be so revealing that it, it almost looks like it's painted on. And there is no shame. Uh, the natural instinct is to be ashamed when your hand is caught in the cookie jar and your mother, your child and your mother and father catches you, there is a shame. But today we're becoming less ashamed about even doing things like that. 
sinning in the face of God with no shame. And this is the world's orientation. We're being educated to this fact. We're being, through the media and through television and through commercials. I, I saw a commercial the other day and I just could not believe my eyes. It was a commercial. And two men were in a bed. As if that was natural, as if that was wholesome. Five years ago, three years ago, I've never seen anything like this. Even in the world, at least it was done in the, you know, in the back, in the dark. But now everything is in the open. And there is no shame. The Bible says in Proverbs 12, 4, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. She that maketh him a shame is rottenness to his bones. Brothers and sisters, the Bible still teaches modesty. No matter who's not doing it, no matter, no matter if preachers are not talking about it, it doesn't matter if the praise team is celebrating, the Bible is still about, and that's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed to tell you these things. In fact, he, he mentions that, that women be adorned in modest apparel because there was a need, brothers and sisters, and he needed someone to have the nerve to tell the church out of love. He's given a warning. Amen. Now, I hope y'all don't hate me after this message, but, uh, I, I, I'm just at a point where I'm not ashamed of God's word. If it's in his word, then we should not be ashamed of it. It doesn't matter if all the kids at school are practicing a certain thing or dressing a certain way. It doesn't matter. You know, I watch little Muslim kids go to these public schools and they put on what their mother and father tell them to wear and there's no questions, there's no peer pressure. They are happy. But we feel a little odd when we're around that crowd. We want to kind of fit in, we want to kind of blend, and little by little we be become ashamed of what we know and unashamed of what we should not be doing. And we find ourselves on the opposite side of God's of pleasing God. Anything valuable is covered. Your cell phone has a cover because it's valuable. Diamonds are in the ground because they're valuable. Gold is deep in the ground because it's valuable. Oil is in the ground, you gotta dig to get it. 1 Timothy 2.9, let women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, not with gold or pearls or costly array. You know, I, uh, you know, I, I, I walk a lot in my area, and I saw a bag that was just laying in the middle of the sidewalk. And, uh, and the bag had, uh, it was like a, a backpack. So I picked it up and I said, somebody must have dropped it. But where would I t uh, return it? So I looked in the bag and there was an address and it looked like valuables and, and personal items. And so I looked, I called the number. It turned out that this person worked at the Syracuse City School District. And so I said, uh, well, I can, uh, the person was so happy that I found it and I said, uh, you know, nice, nice young lady, and, uh, and I said, well, I'm pastor so-and-so, and, and I could meet you at the church and, and, and give, give that to you. She said, I'll, I'll come and pick it up after work. And, uh, and this is just where the world is, you know. And I'm, not, I'm not condemning, because, you know, when you don't know, when you don't know the word, you just, you just don't know. And God winks at ignorance. And so when she came, she walked toward me, and she had an 
earring in the nose and an earring in the middle of her mouth, and she works for the Syracuse City School District. I was not expecting that. But that's where society, society is. And we have always held standards and biblical truths that will liberate people from this type of bondage. Because Satan want, wants that girl to look like someone who worships voodoo. And that's what she looked like. And he's making fools of God's people. And all of people are God's people. They just don't know it, some of them. So I just prayed and invited her uh, to the church. But the influence of the world, you know, you turn on the news, and I can't watch the news except for some program. And it looks like, you know, some, everyone is trying to look like the burlesque queen or an exotic dancer or a lap dancer. You, you know, these are things that, that I knew about when I was in the world. And so now these things have become more acceptable. It's more fashionable to dress this way, to even look this way, to have eyelashes four inches off your head. This is, this is, you know, and our young people are experiencing this. Why? Because they're being indoctrinated with the philosophy of Satan's vision of where he wants to take this world. And God has called us to not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me and my words. So who's going to tell them? And Paul felt back then there was a need to bring these items to the church so the church could be a place of safety, a place of refuge. Our young men are becoming, becoming unashamed of the, the, the music that's out there. Making and listening to music that disgrade, degrades women with explicit language, disrespectful to women and children, and yet it's popular. Language, I, I, no rating, no, no. No censorship or anything. This, this is just blaring out in the streets everywhere. It's a different world, brothers and sisters. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 5, it's better to hear the rebuke of the wise than to listen to the song of fools. You know, these rap artists have become idols for many young people. And their message is anti-God and demonic. And if we don't guide our young people and set a right example, because you know, when some young person who represents Christ, who's not ashamed of you know, being, being a messenger for him, and through their lifestyle, being a witness, and it can have a, a lot of influence. So we want to call our young people as well as our adults to not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Don't be sucked in by the culture that is seeking to indoctrinate you. You know, the theology, uh, 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 the philosophy now is there is no gender. Oh yes, there is gender. A boy is a boy and a girl is a girl. And now they want to have neuter gender bathrooms so that your biological daughter can share a bathroom with, with someone who's biologically male but yet who has classified themselves as a female. They got all the parts of a male, they're just in the, in the bathroom with your daughter. 
This is the society that we're living in. It's the wine of Babylon. It is confusing. Confusion. And, and God is saying, come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her sins. Because there will come a judgment, brothers and sisters. Why do you think we're having natural disasters? Every week there's something new. God is still the same. Malachi 3.1 says, I am the Lord God, I change not. My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone out of my mouth. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. God is merciful. Society has changed. Same-sex marriage and same-sex relationship is against God. Why? Because God has said it. Let us not be confused. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verses 9 through 11, the Bible says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, or the effeminate. Okay? So let's not try to legitimize that just because society says it's okay, the governor says it's okay, even the president of the United States says it's okay. It is against God. There's a distinction between male and female, and that's the way God made it. Nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkenness, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But you say, I was born this way, pastor. God is not asking you how you think you were born. He's asking the question, have you become a new creature in Christ? Because Paul says, such were some of you, but you are washed and sanctified, and you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. So we can change. We can be transformed. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. You know, when I was a child, my mother knew uh, little Richard. I don't know if you remember him, but he passed away not too long ago. Became a mighty warrior for the Lord. But he lived that homosexual lifestyle because he thought he was that way. He felt it was that way. And I remember as a child, my mother knew him. We were just in the, you know, like five and six. And my mother would say, come out and dance for little Richard. And we'd come out and do the twists. And I'm, that's going way back. <laughs> The twist. Young people never heard of that. But we come out and do the twist. And he was just, you know, real, real, you know. He had that lifestyle, that way about him. But later on, before he died, he testified. He said, no, that's not who I was. You know, I was indoctrinated into that. And, and uh, he said, no, it's wrong. And he confessed. He was on 3 ABM. You could go back and, and look at it. But uh, you know, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You can overcome that just as you can overcome lying and stealing and, and uh, pornography and every other sin. Sin is sin. sin. Sin hasn't changed. We can legitimize it. Gender identity is not interchangeable. And now if you... In some states, they're making it legal now that if you don't allow your child to identify w as an opposite sex, they could bring you to court for abuse because you're emotionally abusing that child. Because that child wants to be a child who has not even developed, you know, that ailment was uh, classified not long ago as a mental illness, not as an orientation. But now it is so normalized that you, as a parent,
can be classified as abusing your child if you insist that we will not have this as a part of our house. So that's, that's the danger of, of the public schools nowadays. And so gender identity is important. It is not interchangeable. Uh, let boys be boys, let girls be girls. And I don't believe we should dress boys up like girls and call them cute because that is the beginning of it. You know, with their hair all out and like girls, boys should look like boys and girls should look like girls. No matter what culture says, this is what the Bible says. The Bible says, woe unto him who calls evil good and good evil. And that's what we're seeing. Jeremiah 8 points that out. Good has become evil and evil good. Let me, let me turn there. Jeremiah. The Bible says in verse 12, chapter 8, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush, neither therefore fall, shall they fa neither shall, neither could they blush, therefore they shall fall among them that fall in the time of their visitation, they cast down, saith the Lord. So we are living in a time where there is unashamedness and evil is called evil, uh, good and good is called evil. And God has called us as his children, as his representatives, to not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God. And yes, Christians, as Christians, we need to be ashamed of some things. As Christian, the world is not ashamed and becoming more and more unashamed of their ungodly practices, but we need to be ashamed of some things. We need to be ashamed of disobeying our parents. We still need to be ashamed of having a bad attitude in the church because I didn't get this office or that office or for whatever reason. We still need to be ashamed of taking out retaliation against someone we think has wronged us. We need to be ashamed of accusing someone without two or three witnesses. We need to be ashamed to not apologize when we have done wrong. We need to be ashamed as Christians. But there's one thing we should not be ashamed of, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. And I just want to challenge you as, as church members, it doesn't matter how many or how few accept this challenge, but I, I challenge you to allow God to use you to be a witness in areas where you may have felt a little timid to share your faith or to reach out to a brother. And, and I'm not talking about being overbearing with someone. I'm just talking about putting yourself in the ring and just being willing to talk, willing to share, ask God for wisdom. When you see someone that's uh, strung out by Satan that you could like uh, despise, you know, because a lot of these sins God calls an abomination just straight out. Instead of despising them, I challenge you, okay, God, what can I say to be a witness? You know, I was going on my walk, uh, on the creek walk. My wife and I uh, go there many, uh, almost every day. 
and I was by myself, and I saw a guy smoking. And the smoke was so bad, I couldn't tell whether it was marijuana or if it was a cigarette, because even cigarettes don't smell the same way anymore. And what I'm hearing is they're mixing them both together, and they're both legal, and, and so on. I walked past the brother, and I said, rather than just, why, why these guys? I said, go back and talk to them. I, I, the Lord impressed me to go back and talk to him. So I went back. I said, hey, brother, how you doing? He said, I'm doing fine. <sighs> you know, he blows smoke. And I, I, yeah, I have asthma. I can't stand smoke. But I said, oh, brother, I'm doing fine. I said, you know, uh, you know, there's a better way. You know, I said, why, why do you want to hurt you? Because he, he looked like he was 70. I, I, said, I said, brother, you know, you don't want to keep doing that because that's going to hurt your, 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 um, your health. And he said, well, brother, this is, this is good stuff. You know how old I am? I said, how old you are? He said, I'm, I'm 70. No, no, he said, I'm 40. And I said in my mind, brother, you look like you're 70. Right, because he looked bad. He said, I'm, and I said, you know how, how old I am? He said, you about, uh, about uh, 35. I said, brother, I am 67. And you know how I got there? Because I quit smoking a long time ago. And I said, God wants to do the same thing for you. And I said, why don't you come to our church? We have a five, seven day plan to stop smoking. Right on the corner of such and such. And I said, you can come anytime. And I gave him the information. I planted the seed. And, and I felt God used me to help someone because I took up the challenge to not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. A couple of weeks ago, Three young men, teenagers, were, were walking, and I was walking toward them, and one of them said to me, hey, bro, I got some of that good stuff. And the Lord said, don't let this go. These are young people. These are, they're young enough to be your children. I said, oh, you got what? He said, I got some of that stuff, man. I said, you got some of that stuff. And I said, you know, I, I used to have that stuff. But I got some better stuff, you know. I said, you know what stuff I got? He said, oh, what stuff you got? I said, I got Jesus, and he's giving me more peace. That it passes understanding. I looked him dead in his eyes. I said, you're old enough to be my son, and I wouldn't lie to you. I've been where you are. And they kind of shyly, you know, kind of walk back, you know. But at least a seed was planted. Because I got to the place not being ashamed of the gospel of Christ every day. When you're at the gas station, not be ashamed. Not, not just on Sabbath morning, you know, because we all get up and read and preach and all. No. He's saying, don't be ashamed, whether you're a teacher in a school, wherever you work. Accept Paul's challenge by not being ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. And you can start at home because many of us have children that are not practicing our faith. Instead of despising them, and start, instead of being angry, you know, just show Christ. And sometimes, listen, Christ does the opposite of what our natural instincts dictate. You know, maybe it's in your marriage, you feel like getting back, you feel like uh, striking, but why not do the opposite? Why not do what Christ would do and see the impact that would have? I challenge you to be patient when you feel like being irritable. That's not being ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You're asking God for help because in you there's nothing. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I can be patient. I don't have to give a critical word or a, 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 a smart mouth, you know, in my relationship. I'm... I'm I'm sharing even with those who think they got to get a divorce. 
How about living the opposite of how you're portrayed and see how that impacts your relationship? Why not let Jesus live through you and let him give you the strength to love your wife or your husband in your current situation? So Paul says, Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. While the world is, thinks you're weird, the challenge is now's the time to stand and not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Represent Christ. Well, pastor, I'm timid, I'm shy. Then ask God for a creative way to share your faith, right? Whether it's at school, you may not be a preacher, but you can share your life by allowing his light to live in you. And so I, 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 I just want to offer a special prayer that uh, we all accept this challenge. And if you want special prayer to be able to, to resist the influence of the wicked one who wants to push us in the direction away from the gospel, away from his word, to the point where we become unacceptable, where we become, as Jesus said, ashamed of me and the gospel. It's a warning. God wants us to stand and put on the whole armor of God that we might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You know, the devil doesn't just come right out and make things look horrible. He does it drop by drop. You know, fentanyl, a little fentanyl on a needle can kill a child, right? It's just a little bit. And he is supplanting, he's entering the church. But we can't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So if that's your desire, Lord, I want to be more unashamed of you and your words. Then just raise your hand. Okay. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, O oh Lord, for your words. We thank you for the experience of being a, a witness. We thank you, O oh God, that you were willing to send us prophets to share with us what needs to take place in our lives so that we can be disciples of Christ. We thank you, O oh God, for the kingdom you have prepared for us. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the character that you're, you're desiring us to, to emulate. We thank you for the fruits of the spirit that you're trying to produce in our lives. And Lord, we're asking for more power today. More power to represent you in a way that is counter to this world. But at the same time, is loving to this world. To love our children, and our friends enough to tell them the truth, but to allow you to guide us on how to do it. And so, O oh, oh Lord, we ask, O oh God, that you would strengthen us and give us wisdom, because you promised to give us, and give us faith to believe, Lord, that when you speak, uh, that it, it, it will make an impact in our lives. Your promises are real. Give us faith to trust you and to trust your word. And so we trust, O oh Lord, that you have planted a seed in our hearts and those who listen so that we might become more solid disciples who are growing more and more into your image is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
believe our closing hymn is 457, I believe. Yeah, okay, so we can all sing that. To tell the story, give me my failing glory, to tell me of the golden dream. I love to tell the story, it did so much for me. the reason I tell it now through thee. I love to tell the story, twill be my feeling glory. To inspired to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I pray as we depart from this sanctuary that we will practice and remember 
the story uh, of Jesus and what, what he's done and help us not be ashamed of the gospel as we go forth. May we enjoy the remainder of the Sabbath, um, reminding ourselves, Lord, of what you have accomplished uh, on our behalf. We ask for your Holy Spirit to give us strength, give us wisdom, and give us courage. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I have a moment of reflection. We would like to thank the Lord for using Pastor Nixon yet again and reminding us the times that we live in and for us to truly be unashamed, right? As he rightfully said, there's so many people are unashamed, the things they should be ashamed of, and we have the truth in God's way, so let us not be ashamed of it. Uh, just a, re uh, a quick announcement. Uh, we have fellowship meals.